Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining tonight. My name is Hadley Freeman. I'm a staff writer at the Sunday Times. And as a fully paid up member of the Kingdom of Hagdom, I'm completely thrilled to be talking to Victoria Smith, author of Hags, this evening. Um, Victoria, I'm sure, as many of you out there know, um, is a very uh, accomplished and brilliant journalist. She blogs under the name Blusswitch. And I've been reading her for years, and I just completely devoured Hags. So, um, Thank you so much, Victoria, for taking the time to talk to us this evening. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations on the book. I wondered um, if we could start with, uh, I read recently that you are part of a trend. Janice Turner of The Times recently cited you alongside Kathleen Stock, Mary Harrington, Julie Bindle, Louise Perry, and Helen Joyce as being at the vanguard of what she calls material feminism, which she defines as a feminism that asserts the primacy of biological reality on women's lives. And obviously citing that in particular in relation to hags. Do you agree with that definition? I mean, I think that's quite a diverse group, but um, I do think something's happened in feminism in the past, say, 10 years that has driven a lot of us to assert the primacy of the body much more than the, than we were doing. I, you know, I think um, it's because there's been this trend towards, I don't know, sex denialism, flight from the body, whatever you want to call it, which has always been there a bit in, in the sense that... Um, that's the way some women have seen liberation as kind of denying the body. It's got much more intense in recent years. And I think there are many of us that feel that we've had to like choose which to choose which way to jump to either kind of deny the body has any importance or to actually really insist on it and really interrogate it in a way that we haven't had to do earlier. I think before there was a kind of assumption that the body did matter, but you could downplay it a bit. But I think I think we can't now, but I think that's quite interesting and quite exciting for feminism at the moment. Hmm. Uh, you write about this in the book. There's fear that if we, so if women talk about the differences in their bodies, that will then giving means giving up equality. So how do we balance that? If we say actually women are, aren't as strong as men, you know, we do have these physical differences, and yet we should still be allowed to do all the same jobs they can. <laughs> like, I mean, I use the word allowed there slightly with caution, but how do we balance that acknowledging difference but still demanding equality? I think we really have to get away from the idea that difference means inferiority, which I think that gets really instilled into women and girls. And it, from quite an early age, I think I, I felt it very much when I was growing up that kind of ideas about female intellectual or moral or physical inferiority were always there whenever you were admitted or focused on any any physical difference between women and men and there's this fear of celebrating anything that women can do that men can't do because that will be used against us but i think as long as you are in denial of it i think there's always this little voice in you that is thinking well maybe we are inferior maybe you know if, you, if you're going to deny how important our physical differences are I think it, it shows a kind of lack of confidence in the fact that we are just as valuable and just as important and in no way inferior to men. So, you know, I think you have to kind of celebrate the things we can do, but also be really careful to analyse the differences and what they really mean, because there are so many false interpretations put onto um difference you know this idea that men are stronger than women I think it's really important if we're looking at something like male violence but it doesn't mean that their bodies are in some essential way better than ours you know they're not I mean we give birth mm -hmm. for instance and also you write so interestingly in the book about your own personal history of trying to deny the body. And I think there is that really, that real interesting irony in, there has been this long history, like you say, of women our age, older, you know, insisting we're the same, we can do whatever boys can. And yet the way we try to deny our bodies is often extremely bodily led. Like you and I both had anorexia, other women, you know, try to, you know, you the only way you can prove it is basically punishing your body. So in the end, you can't get away from your body. Yeah. And this kind of denial of the body, it's, on the one hand, it's this trying to prove you're just as good that you're this kind of, I think I quoted Maria Hornbacker's Wasted, where she talks about wanting to be this pure mind, this pure brain, and you know not have anything to do with the body at all. But actually this denial 
is very feminine in some way it's very mm. submissive it, it, in the end it's not really asserting yourself it's denying your own growth and you see this you know now i think you know i've written quite a bit about the use of binders mm. and the way that um it's it's crushing yourself mm. to be considered of the same status mm. as the male people around you and they're not crushing themselves they're just being in their bodies and that's what we should be so let's talk about this path towards the body denialism that we see now with with so many women because like you say this began with a kind of insistence on equality and maybe we could trace that back to the second wave feminism and then things really stepped up a gear in the past decade can you tell me how you see what's happened in terms of women and their bodies and the disconnect between them well i think this kind of denial of the body, you, know, you can trace it back really far in terms of you know, women starving themselves either for some kind of religious transcendence, this kind of idealization, or, or just trying to be considered equal and not, you know, I mean, I, I think my own experience of anorexia was kind of, you know, not wanting to get breasts, not want to be considered an object, wanting to be, you know, just a body, just this gender neutral state that I considered in some ways kind of superior to girls who just allowed themselves to kind of fall into that becoming feminine or female trap. But I think now it's kind of really ramped up a lot because I think partly through spa online spaces and through the strength of gender identity taking primacy over talking about the importance of biological sex you know it's this idea that um you can be whoever you want to be and you can't let the body hold you back and you can be beyond the body and there's this misuse of the term biological essentialism which i think earlier it it was used by feminists to mean the fact that you were born female should not dictate your status in a hierarchy it shouldn't mean you have to do certain roles whereas now that it's the fact that you are born female is almost like shouldn't mean that you are female if you see you know it shouldn't mean that you have to go have to menstruate or get breasts or or just grow normally and mm. thrive mm. if you don't want to mm. now let's talk about your path into hagdom do you think that the prejudice against middle-aged women has gotten worse than before or is it that you and i are noticing it more because we are now middle-aged women i think um I mean, it's kind of hard to disentangle the two. I certainly think that for me, a huge part is noticing it more because I'm older. I mean, it really is this kind of like, oh God, I never thought that happened to me thing. And I have really distinct memories of when I was younger, kind of seeing within my understanding of feminism, the kind of feminism I came to in the early nineties as a young woman, kind of seeing it as a pathway out of ending up in the same position as women my mother's age as a kind of i won't end up like you because because i'm different because i'm liberated because i have all these opportunities and it'll make me not like you and it was almost a feminism that had a kind of misogyny embedded in it that that didn't see a connection with older women but saw feminism as a way of kind of shooting off in a different direction to them and and it's funny kind of a few years ago, you know, I've, I've quoted Adrian Rich quite a lot in the book for because of Woman Born it had huge impact on me. You know, but I only read it when I was forty, and it was like written in, you know, when I was one. But she writes about, um, you know, thinking, oh, when I, you know, look, she, looking at her mother and thinking, I'll have children, I'll get married, but I'll do it differently to you. I'll, I won't be the same as you. And she writes about this this constant image that you kind of look up to the older woman, but think that won't be me I'll, I'll do it better i'll do it differently so there's that and i think that's kind of quite an ongoing pattern but i do think at this particular point in time there is a particular antipathy towards older women within what claims to be progressive feminist culture that you know the, this idea that the older woman is on the wrong side of the history. She's this kind of repository for all these bad old fashioned beliefs about um, 
sex, the body, reproduction, and you can kind of implant all these old beliefs on her. And this generation of older women will die out. And the, the generation that replaces her will be kind of more liberal, more open minded, have fewer boundaries, won't say no so much and won't be so damn annoying. And that's, um, I think that's really prevalent. And it, it's there in, you know, the use of terms like Karen, which, you know, is quite a complicated thing to write about. I think this idea of the entitled, difficult older woman and criticising her as a feminist act is um, mm. very powerful at the moment. And why is that so common with women? I don't see men sort of slagging off the male figureheads that came before specifically, but it's like with every new generation of, I mean, what we can loosely call feminism, it's younger women really disowning the ones who were there before. I mean, Jermaine Greer is an obvious example and really kind of scorning the older women and trying to be, we're not like them, we're the cool ones. And I'm sure I did that in my twenties. I can't remember any specific examples, but I'm sure I did. And now I see it now with young women in their twenties, you know, that's a Karen, I'm a cool girl. Why does this happen among women so much? I think it's this idea of constant re reinvention mm -hmm. and this denial of any kind of legacy or history to women. You know, it's like men are kind of always adding stones to the ed edifice, standing on the shoulders of giants, sort of building. And, and the metaphor we have is like a wave that kind of crashes and recedes. And we're always having to like build things up again from the start. And one thing I think it's this idea of fearing that this fear of being that women are actually losers that women are actually inferior and that we need to start again and we need to kind of prove ourselves still because we haven't done anything yet and one thing that I felt the more I worked on the book was that this desire to disidentify from older women is very much connected to this idea that women don't really have a history women don't really have a legacy women haven't really done anything yet and so each generation of feminists is like, our moment is about to come. Everything's around the corner. We're just about to prove ourselves. One example that I used was the um, the statue of Mary Wollstonecraft, which doesn't actually show Mary Wollstonecraft. It shows this like naked Barbie doll type emerging from all these like formless blobs. You know, this kind of like, we're not there yet. We're about to prove ourselves. We're nearly good enough. And actually, I think that comes from a very deep sense of, a fear that we are just inferior to men. Yeah, you know, mm. it's it's very, I think it gets very deeply embedded in women because we're aware of our difference and we kind of want to deny it because we're frightened that it means we're inferior and we're not. Mm. Now, I want to get into what's really spurred on this moment in particular. Um, but before I do that, I have to say, you know, there's something about the cover of this book and the subtitle that is familiar from another book. And I wondered if there is a connection to another book by another writer that you wanted to make with this book? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, there was kind of, I did have in my mind, sorry, Chavs by Owen Jones, because I think what he did um, very effectively there was pointed out that a marginalised group were being targeted and blamed and stigmatised from a position that was supposedly moral, that kind of it was fine to make fun of working class people because actually they were really bad and that, you know, so so it was legitimate. And I, and I think he was, and I think there's something, a kind of similar, well, it's fine to make fun of work, middle, mid, middle aged women because, you know, they're, they're, they're bad, they're bigots, they're, you know, and they're on the wrong side of history. And there's this kind of elitist position on it that um you know they they don't they don't know what's going on and yes yeah, so there was that but i also um yeah i think he probably wouldn't see that connection <laughs> <laughs> um because you you mentioned before about one of the differences with the current moment is seeing people in allegedly progressive spheres really punching on yeah uh middle-aged women or whether they call them middle-aged you know middle class white you know anything to imply that there's that this one group of women has enormous privilege and therefore we can dump everything on them and that has been to me one of the biggest shocks of the past what is it what is it now seven eight years is seeing these men um really beating up on women do you think that so many progressive men have just been waiting for a moment when they could do this with impunity because that's what it kind of feels like 
I think they're loving it. I think some <laughs> men, it's, and it, it's quite, it's quite shocking in some ways how much some men seem to have really embraced this idea that actually you can be really misogynistic and really aggressive and even justify violence against women if you can kind of put them in this Karen box or mm. turf box and if you found the right name to call them then it's totally fine and so much of it as well it's kind of to legitimize things that they want for themselves you know you know they're not interested in um pe the pension inequality they're not interested in the pay gap they're not interested in who's doing the unpaid labor but they're really interested in sex work is work and calling <laughs> you a massive bigot if you do anything that questions their right to pay for sex for instance right. yeah it's right. they, they've chosen particular causes that they call feminist which actually <laughs> just to meet their own needs and they are really embracing attacking women who disagree and I think there is there is a kind of like thing you know you get the sense that certain men have they're on the progressive team they're on the leftist team and it's always been part of the package has always been you've got to be a feminist you've got to kind of go mm. along with you've got to be nice to the ladies or whatever but it's kind of now that that's changed a bit um mm. you know they're really they're quite happy about it and and i mean it's not completely new i mean if you think um robin morgan's um goodbye to all that you know and a lot of second wave feminism mm. you can see that some of it came out of rage from women at not being included in men's activism in the 60s and early 70s but um mm. yeah it's really quite powerful now i think and also the whole gender identity um, movement is kind of found, founded on a very regressive idea of what a woman is. And inevitably, as you say in the book, middle-aged women kind of don't fit into that. You know, so much of what, of, you know, this idea of like a woman gender identity is, is now basically being feminine. And middle-aged women have gone beyond that. We're, you know, we're not feminine. We're mainly pissed off. Yeah, and it's kind of someone who kind of identifies someone who sees woman as a kind of identity doesn't really see, I don't think they see themselves as a postmenopausal woman, you know, <laughs> you know, that's not how, and it's this kind of, um, it is completely embedded in this idea of femininity, which is so artificial. And there is real annoyance, I think, at women who don't conform to that because they're spoiling this whole idea of what a woman is that is very much based around male ideas and male and and I find it interesting that you can kind of trace it back even if you look at things that were written about the menopause in the 60s when HRT was first coming out mm -hmm. you had these psychiatrists and doctors writing that um you know, when women hit menopause, they just stop being proper women. They become like eunuchs and they, they need treatment. And, you know, I'm not against HRT. I know a lot of women who've really benefited from it. But this place where they were basically saying that um, if a woman's not feminine, she's not a woman. She's just this thing. And that idea is still very powerful, mm. I think. Mm -mm -mm. I, and also the HRT thing is really interesting because obviously there, there's been this slew of books about the menopause that have come out recently by well-known women such as Davinia McCall and I think Mariella Frostrop, and they're all very pro HRT. And, you know, I, I, like you, I know lots of women who've been helped by it, but you do think at a certain point, at what point can a woman just like be like, we don't need to be, you know, our bodies don't need to be pumped up with a hormone that we're not getting anymore is there like or do you, are you just supposed to be on hrt till you're 90 years old like i don't really understand what the argument is anymore no i don't either <laughs> and it's this and it it's also this idea that so unlike with men something goes drastically wrong with right. us when we hit middle age and right. i think um it's quite un uncomfortable it kind of meet it coincides with this time when we're meant to suddenly be really unattractive, that we're meant to become invisible, that we're meant to be more quiet. And when we do speak up, we're called entitled. And it's just this kind of, yeah, I, I worry about narratives that are really obsessed with correcting middle-aged women, even if they're done in a kind of self-help way, because 
narratives about self-help and pampering and <laughs> you you know me time they're always quite double-edged for women you know are they about making you feel better about yourself or are they about making you more acceptable for a society that wants women to be a particular way yeah Young I can... is a Exactly. I mean, you write in the book about um, tweakments and stuff, which is something I have managed to totally resist, as anyone can tell by looking at my face, even though I am like, you know, I live, you know, you know, in London and I'm surrounded by places that offer them. Um, but like you, I just don't see why putting needles in my face would actually make me feel better. I mean, unless 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 my looking unless why my feeling better about myself is dependent on other people telling me I look better. And I feel like at the age of 45, like I've gone beyond that. Like I don't need people to tell me I look better. I just don't have needles stuck in my face. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's really difficult because you you're always aware that um, you will be judged on how you look as a woman. And I think this is another thing that's come through in this supposedly progressive politics that actually has a really misogynistic edge. There's a lot of comments about middle-aged women's appearance that are meant to be kind of showing, they're meant to be showing that they're these women are bad politically, this kind of idea that, oh, she's got a Karen haircut, she's got turf fangs, <laughs> she's got a wrinkly face because she's filled with hate kind of thing. And, you know, she's all saggy because she's eaten up with like resentment at the fact that sex workers are more attractive than her. You know, you see all these sort of messages that combine um, not being attractive with no longer having political relevance and actually being meant to be quiet and they're very kind of slippery because it's like oh we're not really judging you for how we lo you look we're judging you for your politics but we're just like kind of expressing it by criticizing how you look as well and and i find it i mean i've not had so you probably see i've not had any injections or anything but um i'm a, you know i i do feel self-conscious about how i look and kind of this and and you get this kind of um oh you would have those opinions looking the way you do like which you know and I, I know it's nonsense but at the same time you are aware that in certain circumstances how you look is used to discredit and devalue your views it's true but i also feel and maybe i just say this to console myself because i'm too cheap and too scared of pain to go off and have botox but i feel even if i looked really attractive i wouldn't be allowed to have the views that i have like they would still be unacceptable even if i looked like i don't even know who's considered an attractive 40 something anymore julia moore um like i saw an interview with amanda holden in the saturday times this weekend and the whole interview about isn't this amazing she's still really hot even though she's 52 but the only thing she was allowed to talk about was some vitamin drink that she was promoting and i thought well i'd rather look like an old hag and talk about my opinions than have to be all plumped up and talk about a vitamin drink so if those are my options i'll go for hagdom <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sorry, that wasn't a question. That was just a rant. <laughs> um, now I've had loads of friends email, uh, texting me who've already read your book. I have to say, Victoria, I've had so many conversations about your book with friends over the past few weeks. Who everyone I know has just been longing for a book called Hags. Um, and the main thing they want to know is how to talk to their daughters about this. How to stop the sexism that young women feel towards older women, um, and how to kind of prepare their daughters, and also how to help their daughters fight against it. Do you have any tips for that? I mean, it, it is really hard. I mean, one of the things I sort of wrote about in the book going through was trying to imagine um, how my younger self would have responded to what I'm writing now. You know, you know, if you told me sort of 30 years ago, or one day you'll write a book on feminism, I would have imagined it was would be one of those like, you go girl, show the second wave feminists what big at Hagsley. I would, I would never have imagined I'd come out with something like this. But but it's kind of it, it is really difficult to talk across that divide. And you know, I I find it you know, my my mum died when I started writing the book. And I, I find it quite sad that I can't really talk to her about it mm -hmm. now. And you know, we could never really talk across our different views on on feminism and women's roles and who we want to be and they're always and it's always very hard to kind of 
look at other women and understand the compromises they've made and understand how they got to the position that they got to and so and and it's very so i mean i only have sons so i'm not really confronting this as well, well and i do sometimes sons think are the same yeah i mean you tell them too to not just assume so sorry it's my stupid computer not just assume that middle-aged women are irrelevant and you know have nothing to offer anymore basically yeah i, I think I feel with my sons, there's kind of maybe a layer that's not there when, you know, I can talk to them about gender identity and those kind of issues and they might disagree with me, but there's not a fear of turning into me. There's not that extra right. kind of, um, I've got to disidentify from you in the same way because, um, you know, it's a different relationship there. I think um, helping girls to feel confident in themselves rather than confronting them with your own particular views is, is maybe helpful. But it, I think it's really difficult because you have to hold, the, the women I know who are dealing with that, they have to kind of swallow a lot of their own pride and wait it out and mm. kind of be very patient and kind of be second place to while their daughters work things out with their own bodies and relationships with the world. And I think that's really hard because um, well, you want desperately for your children to see that you're a person too, and they have to do it at some point, but it's... It does seem quite striking to me, and thinking back on my own relationship with my parents, and that daughters kind of need to disown their mothers or almost hate their mothers for a bit in order to grow up, whereas I'm not sure if the same is true of sons and fathers. Yeah, the... I was thinking about the Gloria, Gloria Steinem's essay that she wrote on um, sort of younger women and older women and conservatism. She said something about um, sort of a rebellious act, you know, a really rebellious act for a son is rejecting the father, whereas a really rebellious act for the daughter is actually embracing the mother and kind of feeling close to her. And I thought that was, I found that quite compelling just because mm. I think there is so much around daughters that actually encourages them to disidentify and distance themselves yeah which is then carried out in a kind of on a writ large scale in the way they then disown older feminists yes basically. it's kind of yeah. its own form of matricide and that point is backed up by kaz in the audience which um prefaces it with comments not a question and kaz says i'm almost 68 i too used to feel that i would not end up being old unfortunately experience has demonstrated that the only difference between me and younger women is time i am called karen and i find the whole thing incredibly distressing especially when used by younger women that is an interesting point about how many younger women join in on it and is that do you think that comes from a place of almost self-defense or is it um, kind of like trying to prove that they are, you know, that are kind of disowning that they will be older one day or just trying to reassure people around them that they're not on the team with these middle-aged women? I think there's a, there's a kind of wanting this. I think there is a lot of self-protection in there and also maybe a kind of, I think for, for younger women who are privileged, as well in the same way this kind of Karen figure is, you know, if you're white and middle class and um, straight and, you know, you, you, I think there are so many narratives around you kind of getting you to examine your privilege. I think sort of having a go at the Karen figure, which is basically women like your mum, is, mm. is a kind of self-defense fit. And it's also a way of kind of divesting your sort of distancing yourself from privilege that you can't actually help but in, inherit in some way you know this is your heritage it's coming down to you and, and you will become that woman and it I think it's a kind of attempt to push away from it and say that you'll be different and that you'll be better but you have to kind of you have to own it and you have to own your own past as well mm. and your future and that brings me to my um, inevitably favorite chapter in the book, Wrong Side of History Hag, which looks at the demonizing of women and in particular over the past eight years. Do you think that this movement is kind of changing, that the Karen slur is losing its currency? You know, we've seen Keir Starmer walking back from gender identity. You know, it's be it's gone from being a given that, you know, we all have to respect this gender identity thing and that middle-aged women are just the worst to slowly a kind of move to the center. Or do you think 
it's, you know, that, that Pandora's box has been opened and we can't get it back in.